we're going to go over what the inverse of a linear transformation is. We'll also prove that the inverse of a linear transformation is itself a linear transformation and look at a simple example. Of course, if you're studying linear algebra, you've probably been around the block a time or two, you know what an inverse is, and so this definition should be pretty familiar. If T is a linear transformation mapping V to W, and it's one to one, which is important, then the inverse of t, which is denoted like this with our familiar inverse notation, is a function from the range of t back to the domain of t, which is v, and it's defined like this. t inverse of w is equal to v, where v is the unique vector in the domain that is mapped into that input vector w. This is why the linear transformation t has to be one to one. Otherwise, when we take the inverse of w, it would not be clear what that should map to. If multiple vectors map to w through the transformation t, then which of those should the inverse map to? Well, there's no good answer to that question. That's why the transformation has to be one to one. Simpler to understand that in a picture, of course, if this is the vector w in the codomain that we're trying to put in the inverse function, well, what happens if there's two vectors in the domain that map to it? Then the inverse function is not defined because it's not clear which of the domain vectors we should map back to. So again, if t were not one to one, then v would not be unique, that vector we're mapping back to, and so t inverse would not be a function. And of course, we're interested in cases where the inverse is a function. Here is a picture of how the inverse function works. It should look pretty familiar to you. Of course, the transformation t could take us from a vector v to a vector w. Then the inverse transformation is just going to take us back, from w back to to v. Put simply, inverse functions undo each other. So if t of v is equal to w, by definition of the inverse, t inverse, we have that t inverse of t of v is equal to v, so you see that t inverse and t undo each other, and the other order works the same way. t of t inverse of w is just equal to w. Note in this case, v, since it's being put into t, is from the domain, whereas w, since it's being put into t inverse, is from the codomain. One other thing to note in the definition is that we say t inverse is a function from the range of t to v. Since t inverse takes images of t and sends them back to the pre-image, it wouldn't make sense to take something that isn't an image of t as in something that's not in the range, and put that in the inverse. That doesn't make sense. So the inverse is defined on the range of t. Stuff that t puts out, we put into the inverse transformation. As promised, here's our theorem we're going to prove. If t is a one-to-one -one linear transformation from v to w, then t inverse, the inverse function from the range of t, to the domain is also a one-to-one -one linear transformation. To prove that it's a one-to-one -one linear transformation, we'll first prove that it is linear. So we'll begin with additivity, and then we'll prove it satisfies the homogeneity property. To prove that the inverse is one-to-one, -one, we'll prove that its kernel is the zero space. I'll leave a link in the description to a video where we showed those things are equivalent. Having the kernel as a zero space is the same as being one-to-one. -one. The primary things we'll use in the proof are, no surprise, t's linearity and the fact that t is one-to-one. -one. So check this out. For additivity, we're going to take two arbitrary vectors from the domain of the inverse. That means we're taking two arbitrary vectors from the range of the transformation. We know, since t is one-to-one, -one, that there are unique vectors in the domain, v1 and v2, that map to those two vectors from the range. So v1 and v2, v1 maps to w1, v2 maps to w2. Again, t is one-to-one, -one, so we know these unique vectors exist. Then we can take w1 plus w2 and put that into the inverse function. Now to show that the additivity property is satisfied, we need to show that t inverse of w1 plus w2 is the same as t inverse of w1 plus t inverse of w2. Well, w1 we can replace with t of v1. They are of course equal. w2 we can replace with t of v2. Thus we have t inverse of t of v1 plus t of v2. But t we already know is linear, and so the sum of these images we can rewrite as the image of the sum. 
Thus, we have T inverse of T of V1 plus V2. This is great because now we have the inverse of T and we have T inside of it. And we know those undo each other. T inverse of T of V1 plus V2, by definition of the inverse function, is V1 plus V2. Again, the inverse functions undo each other. V1 plus V2, though, of course, we know that those are T inverse of W1 and T inverse of W2. Because remember, T of V1 is W1. So if you take the inverse on both sides, you get that T inverse of W1 is V1. So that's how we make that replacement. Similarly, we know that T of V2 is W2. So if you take the inverse on both sides, we have that V2 equals T inverse of W2. And so we've shown that T inverse of W1 plus W2 is equal to T inverse of W1 plus T inverse of W2. The additivity property is satisfied. Next, we'll prove the homogeneity property, which follows in a similar manner. We begin with an arbitrary vector from the domain of the inverse transformation, as in an arbitrary vector from the range of the original transformation. Since the transformation T is one-to-one, -one, we know there exists a unique vector V in the domain, so that T of V is equal to W, that arbitrary vector from the range of the original transformation. Then, for any scalar k, we should consider t inverse of kw. Our goal, of course, is to get that scalar k out of the inverse function. Now, kw, we know that's the same as k times t of v, because, of course, t of v is equal to w. But t, we know, is a linear transformation, and so the scalar k we can bring inside of t. Thus, k times t of v we can replace with t of kv. This is now in a form we quite like, t inverse of t of kv. t and t inverse undo each other, and this is equal to just k times v. But then, we know that v is equal to t inverse of w, because remember, t of v equals w. So taking the inverse on both sides, we have that v equals t inverse of w. Hence, t inverse of kw equals k times t inverse of w. We can take scalars out of the inverse transformation, and so the homogeneity property is satisfied. We've established that the inverse transformation is a linear transformation. Now it just remains to show that it's one-to-one -one by showing that its kernel is the zero space. And this follows quickly from t being a linear transformation. So again, we're going to show that t inverse is one-to-one -one by showing that its kernel is the zero space. To do this, take an arbitrary vector w from the kernel of t inverse. Then we're going to show that this vector must equal zero. We know if w is in the kernel of t inverse, that t inverse of w must equal zero. That's just by definition of the kernel. And so we know by definition of t inverse that the original transformation t must map zero to w. For t inverse to map w to zero means that t must have mapped zero to w. But t is a linear transformation, and we've previously proven that linear transformations map zero to zero. So if the linear transformation t maps zero to w, the only possibility is that w is equal to zero. Since w was just an arbitrary element from the kernel of t inverse, this means that the kernel of t inverse contains only zero. The kernel is a zero space, and that's equivalent to t inverse being one to one. One minor detail, how do we even know that the kernel of t inverse contains anything? Are we allowed to just take an element from the kernel, assuming that it's non-empty? It's certainly non-empty, because remember, t maps the vector space v to the vector space w. And if v is a vector space, it has to have a zero vector. That means the transformation t maps zero to something. And by definition of t inverse, whatever that image of zero under t is, that image is going to be in the kernel of the inverse. But again, this fact that the kernel of t inverse is the zero space is sufficient to establish that it is a one-to-one -one linear transformation. We'll finish with an example of finding the inverse of a linear transformation. This is a linear transformation we've discussed several times in previous videos. I'll leave links in the description. How it works is it takes us from the vector space of polynomials of degree up to n and maps us to the vector space of polynomials up to degree n plus one. 
how it works is it takes a polynomial and just multiplies it by x. So every non-zero term has its degree increased by 1. We previously saw how this transformation is certainly not onto, because, for example, no non-zero vector in Pn would map to a polynomial with a non-zero constant term. If the polynomial we plug into this transformation is non-zero, all of its terms are going to get hit with a factor of x by definition of the transformation, so there won't be any constants in the image. So no polynomial with a non-zero constant is going to be mapped to by this transformation, so it's not onto. But that's not not a problem for the inverse existing. For the inverse to exist, the transformation just has to be one to one, and in this case, it certainly is. If we have two distinct polynomials, p and q, that we're plugging into the transformation, if they're distinct, they must differ in at least one coefficient, and that forces their images to differ in at least one coefficient as well. For example, if the two polynomials differ with the coefficient of the x term, those linear terms have different coefficients, then they're going to differ in the coefficients of the squared terms once we put them through the transformation. Since the transformation is one-to-one, -one, the inverse is defined. It's defined, of course, on the range of t, which in this case consists of polynomials up to degree n plus 1, but they got to have a zero constant term. Again, there's no vectors in the range that have a non-zero constant term. And it's pretty easy to see how the inverse transformation will work. It's going to take one of these polynomials up to degree n plus 1 with no constant term, and it's going to send it to this polynomial, which just comes from the input polynomial, but decreasing the degree of each term by 1. So where we did have c0 x to the 1, in the image we have just c0 where we did have c1x squared, in the image we just have c1x to the 1. So the degree of every term is decreased by 1 because what the inverse function is doing is undoing the original transformation's multiplication by x. Just as an example, the inverse of 4x plus 3x squared minus x to the 4 is going to be 4 plus 3x minus x cubed. Notice how each term just has its degree decreased by 1. If we were to plug 4 plus 3x minus x cubed into the original transformation, each term would be hit by a factor of x, and that would get us to this, 4x plus 3x squared minus x to the 4. So that's what inverse linear transformations are, how to prove that they are themselves linear transformations, and a fun little example. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlists in the description for more. If you found my video helpful, please consider supporting what I do by joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can get early and exclusive access to additional videos and extra practice, and if you join at the premium tier or above, you can access the lecture notes used in my courses. Thanks for watching.